As all of you know, life can be a struggle. Sometimes, making ends meet isn't always as easy as just getting a job. Several years back, I couldn't find a job. It was rejection after rejection, and at the time, nobody was really hiring, and the few places that were hiring were very ultra-competitive. I was barely making over minimum wage as a deli employee at a grocery store. I remember one night, I was working online, looking for ways to make extra money, and I ended up stumbling upon Craigslist. I had heard of Craigslist, but never really explored it for myself. I found an ad on Craigslist for a freelance job where I would be what's called a secret shopper. For those of you who may not be familiar with what a secret shopper is, it's basically an anonymous customer who comes into a store and asks the employees a series of questions. The employee is then graded on certain criteria. For example, does the employee make eye contact, greet you, give a suggestion, offer to escort the customer, and give a parting comment, etc.? It seems simple, but a lot of companies, specifically the store I work for, will reprimand the employee for a bad secret shopper score, and even fire the employee if they get more than one bad score. Since I had experience in the store, and I knew exactly what they were looking for, I thought that this would be an easy way to make some money on the side. The first store I visited was a local chain of grocery stores in my hometown. Oddly enough, it was the same company I worked for, but not the same store, though. I started making my rounds and noticed a man, probably in his 20s, stocking the shelves. He looked at me and immediately put his head back down. He didn't greet me, so he got points off right away. I had to greet him and ask him where the canned tuna was. He never lifted his head from stocking the shelves and just sort of angrily said, aisle two, halfway down. This guy lost points for not making eye contact and offering to show me where it was located. Also, just for the record, I know how ridiculous all of this is, but these stupid companies take this junk so seriously that they don't care if you're waiting on another customer. Whatever the excuse is, if you get a bad score, you're kind of screwed. I was trying to pause and give the guy a chance to redeem himself by telling me to have a good day. But he never did, and I eventually had to initiate the parting remark. That's when he finally looked up and said, yeah, you too. I finally saw his name tag, and written on it was the name, Patrick. I smiled and walked away, but I noticed that Patrick kept his eye on me. I felt his stare as I walked away, and I started to figure that he was on to me, that I was maybe a secret shopper. I was going to ask a few more employees questions, but I started to feel uncomfortable every time I looked up. I could see this Patrick at the end of the aisles, it almost seemed like he was following me. I wasn't sure what the end game was for this guy, but I didn't want to find out. I cashed out, and the cashier passed her secret shop with flying colors. After I cashed out, I briskly made my way to my car. I just wanted to get out of the store so badly and be done with this. Once I was in the car, I started writing down the full report before I drove off. I just wanted to get all the information down while it was still fresh. But while I was writing, I looked up and saw my buddy from the aisle, Patrick, intensely walking through the parking lot. I ducked down a little bit, but thankfully, it didn't appear like he had noticed me. He just kept walking until he got to his car which was a dark, four-door sedan of some kind, and then he sped off. I waited a few minutes before I departed. I don't know why, but this guy just gave me the creeps. I kept thinking to myself, why was he following me around the store like that? If he really was, but it truly did feel like he was, and it just felt so weird. I'm a textbook overthinker, so I tried telling myself maybe I was overthinking, but something about him was just definitely off. That night, I went home and I emailed my supervisor the report, and life went on. It only took a day or two for me to completely forget about that interaction. A few nights after I turned in the report, I was having a late-night dinner with my boyfriend. We were just hanging out, enjoying each other's company. The relaxing evening was interrupted by a loud and consistent banging on the front door. It wasn't just an aggressive knock either. It was like the sound of someone throwing their entire body weight at the door. 
You have no idea how horrifying it is to hear a knock at the door at that hour, let alone a banging knock like this one. We looked out the window, and I was at a loss for words. It was that Patrick guy from the grocery store, and he looked horrible. His eyes looked like they were sunken in, and he looked like he hadn't slept in days. I called out, telling him to leave right now, that I was calling the police, and he didn't even flinch. He just kept banging and demanding that I let him enter the home repeatedly. He kept saying that I ruined his life and that I needed to pay, that there would be an eye for an eye. I remember him saying that, and I didn't even want to think about what he meant by that. While this interaction was happening, my boyfriend had called the police, though they must have been in the area because the first squad car showed up in less than two minutes. And it's a good thing too, because I don't know how much longer my door was going to hold up. Patrick was really throwing himself into the door, and this whole sight was nuts. A cop tackled Patrick right on my front steps and handcuffed him. While they were apprehending him, they ended up finding a knife concealed in his waistband, which, for me, was the most terrifying information about this entire ordeal. I still can't stop thinking about what he intended to do with that knife if he had broken down the door. After he was arrested, I did get some closure on this whole nightmare. It turns out it was just a situation of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Apparently, Patrick was at the end of the cliff, and my visit to the store that day was what forced him to fall completely off. He was struggling to pay his bills, and from what I was told, his girlfriend had just broken up with him the day of that secret shopping event. When I approached him in the store that day, he was only minutes away from the end of his shift and was just mentally completely done at that point. I get it, we've all been there, well, to a degree, and I happened to catch him on a bad day, and asking for a can of tuna was the last thing on his mind. He ended up losing his job because he had failed another secret shopper report, a report that I sent in. The part that I still can't figure out is how he found out where I lived. I don't think he followed me that day after the store, but there's no other way that he would know where I lived. I stayed at my boyfriend's house after that night, and I rarely stayed at my old house alone. I don't know what happened to this guy, but I genuinely hope that he figured it out, and more importantly, I hope these stores get rid of the secret shopper program because it's just horrible. I want to acknowledge right from the start that I realize how dangerous a place like Craigslist can truly be. Even though there are tons of genuine and legitimate postings, I understand that it's still a hotbed for dangerous and horrible humans. I learned this for myself 10 years ago. Even back then, I knew that it wasn't the best place in the world, but I ignored all the horror stories because, honestly, I was having some pretty good luck on Craigslist. I was making a ton of money doing side jobs from random postings. I've done everything from pet sitting to picking up a pizza and delivering it to someone's house. My friends at the time called me crazy for doing all these side jobs, but I was addicted to the hustle. I guess I could say I was bringing home more money than most of my friends, and often the work was pretty easy. I continued answering the weird ads for several months. I even had my own special vetting process for identifying when postings weren't legitimate. I got myself a cheap track phone that I used just in case I did deal with some kind of freak, so they wouldn't have my real number. Like all good things, though, this hustle eventually came to an end. One day, I answered a posting that scared me a little too much. Right from the beginning, I should have ignored the posting. It said something along the lines of a secret of gig for big cash. I don't remember exactly what the wording was, but I do remember that it specifically said big cash. This kind of weird wording is usually from some creep on the internet looking for something dirty, if you catch my drift. But like I said, I had a vetting process, so I wasn't going to pass up the chance for this big cash, just in case it was legitimate. I clicked the posting, and of course, it was incredibly vague. I got in touch with the person who posted the job using my track phone, and I was surprised when a nice woman answered the phone. She was so nice and pleasant and introduced herself as Lydia, as I remember. She explained to me what the job was and why the posting was so vague. She said she made the posting for her elderly grandfather, who wanted to maintain his privacy. 
He needed someone to come over to his house and clean his guns. I told her that I didn't have a clue how to do something like that, but she assured me that he would be watching over me, making sure I did everything the correct way. She said she didn't include that information in the ad because she wasn't sure if it was technically illegal to post about guns on Craigslist. I also want to say that, for any gun enthusiasts who may be losing their minds, remember that I didn't know anything about guns at the time, and I really still don't. I didn't know if you needed any sort of training to clean a gun, and I just assumed that since the owner would be there, I'd be fine. So we agreed on the money, and Lydia gave me the address. The day came, and I made the drive to the address. It was only about 20 minutes from my house, but it was still in a very secluded area. The house seemed old and beat up. I knocked on the door, and an attractive woman answered. I pegged her to be in her early 20s, and she introduced herself as Lydia. I could tell right away from her voice that it was the same woman I spoke to on the phone, and just like on the phone, she was very pleasant. She guided me through the house, and it was honestly a very beautiful home. All throughout the house, it had that old school wood finish. It almost looked like a cabin on the inside. As we were walking through the kitchen, Lydia told me that I could just throw my stuff on the counter and that she would take me to her grandfather. Because she was so bubbly and very chipper, I felt very comfortable and at ease. Without even thinking, I threw my purse on the counter and continued to follow her down the hall. At the back of the house was a small room filled with all sorts of amazing war memorabilia. It was clear that this guy was a very decorated veteran. While I was looking at all the awards that this man had, I heard a loud slam behind me. Lydia had slammed the door to the small room and stood in front of the doorway. Next to her was a taller man, and unlike Lydia, he was not good-looking. His face was dirty, and his hair had that perpetual wet look, even though it clearly wasn't wet. I would have to say that he was most likely in his early 20s as well. Realizing that the situation I was in was not good, I just put my hands up in defense. It didn't matter, though. Lydia charged at me, threw me to the wooden floor, and I could see the long legs of the man still standing in the doorway. As I lay on the floor, Lydia began kicking me in the ribs. I remember wanting to fight back, but my body just wouldn't move. Finally, the kicking stopped, and I could feel Lydia's face get close to mine. She whispered something like, if you even try to get up, my boyfriend will put you down for good. I stayed on the floor and listened as Lydia and the tall man left the room. They scurried around the house for a bit, and then after a few minutes, I heard two car doors shut. Apparently, they had peeled away. Figuring that it was Lydia and her boyfriend who had left, I tried to get off the ground and made my way to the kitchen. My purse that I had set on the counter was now gone, and that's where I had my phone and my keys. I looked out the window and saw that my car was also gone. The car that drove out of here was my car. I was freaking out on the inside, but I was trying to keep very level-headed on the outside. I started walking down the road until I reached an old man selling vegetables from a farm stand outside of his house. The man could not have been more of a sweetheart. He gave me some food and water, and we called the police. I reported everything with as much detail as I could. The police found my car about 20 miles away from where all this took place. All the windows were broken out, and the inside of the vehicle was completely slashed and destroyed. Thankfully, my purse was left behind with my ID, but all the money had been stolen, which really wasn't a lot. As it turns out, I got lucky with the police being able to actually solve this case. Lydia did a great job covering her tracks on Craigslist and making it seem like she was just a shadow, but fortunately for me, she was also a complete idiot. She lured me to her actual grandfather's house. He was living in Florida for the season, so the house was vacant at that time. Lydia and her boyfriend robbed the house, and they intended to lure someone there to steal their car. Why they ditched the car so close to the house, I still don't understand. They ended up finding Lydia in a motel about an hour away from home. She was alone, and from what I understand, she never told the cops who this man was or where he went. 
In case it wasn't obvious, this was the last job I ever took on Craigslist, and I advise anyone reading this, please be careful. I'm sure we've all made some stupid mistakes when we were in high school. Sometimes it's not even you who makes the mistake, but just by joining in with your peers, you can find yourself in a very bad situation. When I was in high school, my friends and I would visit Craigslist and just roast all the weirdos we would find. Trust me when I say there are a lot of weirdos on Craigslist. One night, my friend group let things go a little too far, though. We found an ad from a guy who was looking for a woman to come over and massage his feet. Yeah, some weird stuff right off the bat. We all pretended to be a woman named Molly and started messaging this guy from a fake email account that we created. This was before the whole catfish phenomenon was talked about, but we were basically doing that same thing. It just didn't have a mainstream name yet. Even though this guy was a creep, we were still in the wrong for leading him on and pretending to be something we were not. My friend Dan was pushing the envelope, though. He was flirting and saying some things that he should not have been saying, and it was only a matter of time before this man sent us his address. Everyone started laughing, and I also laughed, not really finding it that funny, finding it very weird, but I did just want to fit in. To be honest, I just wanted this practical joke to end, and I hoped we could arrive at that. Dan wasn't ready to let the joke end just yet. He wanted to visit the creep's house and actually try to get a glimpse of the man. I very much voted against this, but Dan peer pressured the group, and before I even knew it, we were in the car and on the way to this weirdo's house. The car ride was mostly quiet, other than Dan trying to get us fired up for the occasion. It took us about 15 minutes to get to the neighborhood of the man looking for his foot therapy, as he put it. It was a pretty rough part of town, definitely the area you don't want to be wandering around in after dark. It was clear that everyone was now regretting this decision, except for Dan. We all thought that we were just going to drive by the house and then head back, but he had other plans. We stopped in front of the house, and while we were stopped, Dan opened the door and started making his way to that guy's front door. We all started freaking out, trying to get him to come back into the car. Everyone except my friend who was driving got out of the car and tried pleading with Dan. I remember even forcibly trying to hold Dan back, but he just started pushing through. We were arguing, well, whisper arguing, trying not to bring attention to ourselves. Dan looked at us, and I remember him saying, listen, guys, I need to see what this freak looks like. I promise once I get a quick glimpse, I'll just leave. What's the worst that can happen? I was still against the idea, but I could tell that he won my friends over by saying this. Not wanting to be the coward that I always was, I joined in as we snuck toward the house. I thought maybe Dan would peer through the window or something weird like that, but this absolute maniac went right to the front door. He really was a loose cannon back in those days, and without giving us any notice or any time to prepare or hide, he rang the doorbell. I remember my heart was beating so fast I was convinced that I was going to have a heart attack. Seconds later, this very short but very overweight man wearing a bathrobe answered the door, and we all froze. In a squeaky and, I admit, pretty comical voice, this guy said, what's the meaning of this? Where's Molly? Dan made some very inappropriate joke or comment and then proceeded to call the man a freak. We all just started laughing and briskly walking to the car. I was incredibly anxious, but I was trying to fit in, hence why I was laughing with the group. We couldn't have been more than 10 feet away from the front of the house when this creepy man grabbed a rifle that he must have had right next to the door and pointed it in our direction. His face was all red, and he looked like he was shaking. At that moment, we were all freaking out. Finally, Dan realized that we may have crossed a line there. Obviously, the creepy man did say something, but through all the paranoia, none of us could hear what he said. We all ran as fast as we could, dove into the car, and I looked behind me as I closed the car door. I could see the man starting to give chase with that rifle, still aiming it in our direction. We drove off as fast as we could, and when I looked behind me, he was now standing in the middle of the road, still staring down the barrel of the rifle. 
I ducked down, expecting to hear the rear window glass shatter any second, but thank God it never did. We eventually made it back to the house, and we panicked for the entire night. We actually ended up receiving an email from him not long after we got home that said, I will find you. I saw your car and your license plate. I will find where you live. At that moment, we were beside ourselves. We didn't know what to do. We turned off all the lights, and I'm not kidding, we stared out that window the entire night, holding our breath every time a car would drive by. I remember I suggested maybe calling the police, but my friends talked me out of it. They made me believe that we were the ones who would get in trouble if we called them, so we didn't, and that was the longest night of my entire life. The creep never showed up, though, and we never heard from him again. I tried convincing myself that his threat was just some bluff, but I still never felt safe. It took months of not hearing from him for me to finally feel like I was safe. All these years later, I still haven't been down that street since that night, and even though I'm older, I still have an irrational fear that he'll be outside waiting for me. For that reason, I'll continue to avoid that area of town as long as I can.